Good morning and happy Easter to you. We are so glad that you are here uh, with us today at Pleasant Chapel to worship the resurrection of Jesus today on this, this Easter morning. A uh, special welcome to those uh, that are joining our church, maybe checking us out uh, for the first time uh, from your homes, and we are, we're glad you are, you are here. A few announcements uh, this morning before we begin. Um, surely we know that just about everything has been postponed because of uh, what is going on in our country, but uh, all of our events right now are, are postponed, including, including our, our Tenderloin Supper, which was coming up, uh, our, our membership and Baptism Sunday, which was in a few weeks. Uh, the Whitco Gospel Choir was scheduled to come. That, that won't be happening uh, as well. So everything's kind of put on hold here. Uh, we'll get back to normal here, hopefully in a few weeks, and get uh, get rolling with some of the things that we uh, are are used to doing. We've had several people ask about about giving. Uh, if if you would like to uh, continue with your giving, you can you can write a check, make it payable to the church, and send it to Ann Ann Henline, and just send it to her home address, and you'll find that in, in the directory. Uh, today, Easter morning. Uh, at 1130, we are, we're going to have a special worship service. We are going to have an Easter worship parade. And that will begin here at the church at 1130. And we are going to drive by several church members' homes. And I believe some of those are going to be decorated with some Easter, Easter decorations. And we'll, we'll make that a competition to see who's got the best, uh, the best decorated yard or, or car or mailbox or or, or whatever there. We're going to do that, and we're going to keep this as a safe event. Uh, we don't want anybody getting out of their car. Uh, we just want to stay in our cars and uh, drive through the neighborhood and perhaps drive through the town of Roanoke and um, just have fun that we can perhaps get together and look at each other uh, through the windows of our cars uh, and celebrate Easter the best we can that way. So looking forward to seeing everybody uh, back here around 1130. So let us begin to worship. And Joanne, if you wouldn't mind getting us started with a song, that would be great. And Raleigh, if you would perhaps light the candles and get the acolytes to come down here, we'll... No? Well, then perhaps uh, 
We could all turn in our hymnals. No, we'll op- op- open your Bible. No. We can't do that. We can't do any of that today because we're not... We're not together. We cannot do that. But for sure, what we can do is we can worship remotely from your own homes. We're glad that you have the, the, the opportunity to do that uh, with your family in your living room or wherever you may be. We're glad that we uh, live where we can utilize technology to, to, again, come together as a family the very best we can uh, to worship God. So we are, we, we're glad that you are doing that in your homes. What we can do, though, we can, we can worship. We can pray together. We can share in God's word together, and that is just exactly what we are we're going to do today. So let's begin with a prayer together as a family. Our Father, we thank you for this Easter morning. We are, we are here with a, a bounce in our, in our step and, and light in our hearts, and we are just excited to be able to celebrate once again the resurrection of your Son, this victory that we have in, in Jesus over... Uh, victory over death. The cross looked like it had the world defeated. It looked like it had Jesus defeated. But that Sunday morning, we celebrate today that he rose from that grave and proved once and for all his victory over death. We are a people who are embracing Jesus that way. We, we too give ourselves over to death, death of our, ourselves and death of sin in our lives in order that we may be raised to life in Christ, that we also may live a resurrected life that's found only in trusting in Him. Lord, we give you this day, this, this time of worship, that we again remember uh, you and your work and your love for us, because it is the greatest act of love that you sent your Son for us. We just ask that through what we would do today would bring a blessing to you and the way that we would worship in this best way that we can under the circumstances we are in. And Lord, we just lift up this whole nation, this whole world in the middle of what is happening here. Those people that are on the front lines doing all that they can to bring comfort to those that are sick and comfort of those to those who have, have lost people. All of those that are in the field of, of medicine that are working tirelessly to comfort people that are sick and to find a cure to this virus. And those that are keeping the country going in all of the essential things that we have food on the table and gas in our cars and all of those that are, that are able to keep life going in this country as well, even though they are in danger. We lift all of those up to you. Lord, we are reminded again of the, the fragile nature of life through what we are uh, facing right now. And we know that you are the author of that life and our eternal life and our abundant life is found only in you. And we praise your name. Amen. The last several weeks at Pleasant Chapel, we have been discussing the the final time of Jesus on on earth, the last week or so of the events that led up to his crucifixion on that Friday. We began talking about uh, the, the instance of Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha, Lazarus had had died, and after four days, Jesus came and raised Lazarus back to life. And they threw a party in, in his honor at Lazarus' house, and Mary and Martha were there. And it was there that Mary anointed Jesus' feet with expensive perfume, and she dried his feet with her hair. And then we talked about that Thursday night when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And it was there where he brought to us the, the, the new mandate, the, the, the new command to love one another. And he brought a new covenant that night as well, a covenant that was going to be based on, on his blood, and he symbolized that through the cup and the loaf. And we talked about what happened later on that evening with the betrayal of Jesus by, by Judas and his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and his arrest and his, and his trial. And then last week we talked about Jesus' crucifixion on that Friday and what that meant for, for the world. And we symbolize these things with uh, some, some different symbols throughout, throughout that study. But today, today's our big day. This, this is Easter, Easter Sunday. 
we, we celebrate the, the, the resurrection every Sunday. Every Sunday that churches meet, it is a celebration of Easter. Every Sunday's worship service is because of this Sunday's celebration, because it is this Sunday that gives all the other Sundays their meaning and their, their importance. Death and the grave have been defeated. Life forever then and abundant life here now, it's, it's real. And, and this victory that we have is the same victory that his followers had then that you and I share in today. You and I, as followers of Christ, are, are resurrection people. We're Easter people, defined by what happened on that Easter. It's a cross. It is Easter. It's an empty tomb. It is those things where you and I and all followers of Christ find our real identity. So let us once again experience this story. Let's engage in resurrection morning once again. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke and chapter 24 and beginning in verse 1. We read there that on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took their spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. You know, let's, let's take a field trip. I, I want to show you something. Here in this space, we see, we see things that we are expected to see. We, see. we see stones. We see stones that mark people that have gone on before us. We see flowers left behind from their loved ones to memorialize this spot. We see dirt left over from newly dug graves. But inside us, when we come to a place like this, we see something that is especially true about ourselves. We realize our own mortality, the, the inevitability of, of our, own, our own death. A place like this is where our bodies will end up one day. It reminds us of how fleeting life really is. I don't imagine things were that much different for the women that came to Jesus' tomb on that Easter morning. They would have come expecting to see some things that they would have been used to seeing in a place like that. They were full of, of sorrow. They were disappointed. They were, they were torn apart because of, of Jesus. He, has, he was gone, no longer with them. And two, they would have probably thought during that time in this place of death, again, of their mortality as well, the inevitable truth that their lives would one day come to an end like those in those tombs. Clearly their hopes were dashed. They too would no doubt have been thinking about their own mortality. They had hoped things would be different with Jesus. And now the true and inevitable fact of death comes to the front of their minds on that morning, just as it comes to the front of our minds when we're at a place like this. Clearly, the women that had gone to Jesus' tomb to prepare his body for burial would have been perplexed. There's no way they could have wrapped their minds around what it was that they had just experienced. They went there planning on seeing one thing, a sealed tomb and, and a dead body. But what they experienced was something quite, quite different from that. And they're amazed by that. They, don't know, they just don't simply know what to think. We continue with the story picking up in verse 4. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the two men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. 
Then they remembered his words. It was at that moment that, that they got it. It, it, it's, it's more than just remembering, recalling what Jesus had, had said to, to their minds. They understood it. They embraced it. It became theirs. They owned this truth that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So from there then, we continue on with verse 9. When they came back from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words to them seemed like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Peter, too, is perplexed in the facts that have been put before him. He, as well, cannot put his mind around what has just taken place. Luke's story of resurrection morning then, then shifts. He moves to a couple of guys that are, that are walking on a road that's leading to Emmaus. Verse 13 says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they're talking to each other about everything that had happened. They had experienced all of this stuff that had taken place in Jerusalem, where Jesus was, was gaining popularity. And, and then he gets in trouble and he's arrested and he's beaten, flogged, stripped, and crucified, killed, and buried. And they're talking about these events that had, had taken place when Jesus himself comes up and walks along beside them. But they did not recognize him. And he asks them, what is it that you guys are, are, are talking about? And, and they, they tell him in verse 18, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And so they go on to tell them what had taken place about, about Jesus. And they say that he was this prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and before all people. And they say in verse 20 that the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And now at this point, Jesus speaks to the men and says, How foolish are you and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And so at this moment, he begins revealing this big, grand narrative of God's story to these two men on, on their walk. He starts with Moses, and he shares all of the, the facts that they would know about Moses and the prophets and how all of that pointed to him. And they still didn't recognize him. Well, the walk ended up at, at the village of, of Emmaus, and they sat down to have a meal together and Scripture in verse 30 says, When he, Jesus, was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Poof, and he's gone. But it was at that moment that they were let to believe who was in their midst, and it was, it was Jesus. It was for them their got it moment. It was at that point that they recognized him as well, just like the women. They had their moment where truth became true to them. It was revealed to them that this event really did play, take place. Jesus, the dead Jesus, has now been raised. The two men then did what was natural for them to do. They, they changed course and they went back to Jerusalem to let the big 11 know what had happened. They wanted to find Jesus' disciples and let them know that they had encountered him on that road. 
And so they headed back there, and we pick up on the story in verse 35, and these two told the others what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they, had saw, they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And while they still did not believe it because of their joy and, and amazement, he asked them, Do you have something here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So there, Jesus again opens the minds of his followers, his disciples, so that they could see truth. It was at that moment that they, they got it. Their eyes were opened, their minds were opened so that they could, they could understand and they could recognize and they could remember and they could piece this all together. They got it and they got Easter. I think I am getting it a bit more this year as well. I think I am getting Easter a little more fully this time, this time around. You know, when we were in that cemetery, it's hard, it's hard to not think about death. It's hard to not think that your own life is going to come to, to an end where this body is going to give out and we'll have to find a place like those places over there to put this body. I think that inevitable truth of death, it's more present, I think, with, with us today, with you and me this day as we are going through this worldwide pandemic. Death, I believe, becomes more real to you and I because it just seems so close as we turn on the news and we, we listen to how this disease is progressing through, throughout our country and throughout the world. So many have lost their lives and, and so many more are, are suffering tremendously through this. And so no doubt you and I are, more, are, are closer to this truth of death it seems such a small thing, this little coronavirus, but yet it's so, it's so deadly and it's so close. And I'm reminded that this, this life, this life I have and this life that you and I have, it's just a blip on a timeline. It's just a vapor. De death will eventually, it'll eventually come to all of us. The death rate of human beings since the beginning of time, it's, it's pretty high. It's bordering right around 100%. It will, it will come. But it is the power of his resurrection that does bring eternal life then and an abundant life now. And it is that which we celebrate today on Easter. That is why we're here. It is because of that victory over inevitable death that you and I will face. And that is the lens by which I am looking through this situation that I am in today. It is that truth and that power of Easter that provides the right perspective of this current situation that you and I are in. God wins. He's in control and the cross and that empty grave prevails. So now what for those disciples? What is in store for them to do next after they have encountered the risen Christ. If we continue with the story, picking up in verse 46, Jesus tells them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Matthew's account says to the disciples, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
So what is the answer to the question, now what, for those disciples? Well, they were to go and make more disciples. They were the ones that were to preach discipleship, which is that about repentance and of the forgiveness that comes through the cross. They were to go and start the church. They were to build this kingdom that Jesus has brought to earth. And that is exactly what, what they did. That is what they did from that moment on. That is how they answered the question, so now what? We are to build this kingdom. We are disciples that are to go and make more disciples. We are the ones that are to proclaim forgiveness found in him and call people to repentance. We are kingdom disciples called to make more disciples celebrating in this victory you and I celebrate this Easter. Easter has greater significance to me this year. I, I get it a bit more this time. More than just a mere understanding like those at the tomb, it is, it is internalized to me this year, and I hope as well for you. On the other side of this pandemic, it is going to end, there will be this question, now what? What are we supposed to do now? How is it that you and I can live out our lives as Easter people, people of the resurrection, people who have known this story for a long time, but now knowing what we have just lived through, have a new reality on what Easter really means and the victory that is really found there. How is it that you and I, as followers of Christ, can live out this Easter victory in all that we would do? Father, we praise you for the cross. We thank you for the victory found in an empty tomb. We embrace you. We put our trust in you and the work that you have done for us because you love us. May your spirit empower this people, Pleasant Chapel, to become resurrection, Easter people, that on the other side of what we are going through, we would take this experience, empowered by your resurrection and what we know about this day, to do things for you, to be kingdom people, to turn our lives into, into the version of us that you would have us be. May your kingdom grow through us. In your name, amen. So now, at about 11.30, we are going to meet right outside of here, and we are going to have an Easter worship parade. We'll see you in a bit.
has led Alleluia Following our exalted 